Earth. It's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter. And coming up, we're talking about Meet You at High Noon on Saturn. And of course, taking listener questions about all things in this beautiful universe of ours. This show is about that entire universe, and we record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. So call 888-581-0708 to join the conversation. You can also leave voicemails at spaceradioshow.com. It's so easy. Even Greg can do it. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about the difference between a law and a theory. But first, the news. Hello, space fans. Welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today on Space Radio, where we talk about all things space, astronomy, astrophysics, rocketry, general science, fun, imagination. And if it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it's in this show's universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Studio A of WCBE Radio Columbus. Let's call 888-581-0708 to join me live on the air. Or you can leave voicemails on our website. That's spaceradioshow.com. There's a little button you press and you speak. It's so easy. Get those calls in and we'll have a nice little chat. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including Galita, California. That's where garlic comes from, if I remember right. Uh, you can smell it 100 miles away. Austin, Texas, London, UK, Florence, Massachusetts, Lyon, Colorado. Oh, okay, so probably Lyon, Colorado, not Lyon. Colorado, that one's in France, West Garden Grove, California, Poland, and Boulder, Colorado. Man, Colorado representing today. We love it. Go to uh, spaceradioshow.com for the links. Those I'm live streaming right now on YouTube and Twitch. Seriously, folks, I've only prepped 10 minutes of show material tops. Let's get those questions in. Hey, space cadets. I missed you. Before I start taking calls, though, I want to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And this little story, this cute little story caught my, I mean, it's not cute. This is like serious astronomy and astrophysics research, but it's cute, right? Uh, you'd think it'd be an easy thing to determine how long a day is on a planet. You know, and with a rocky planet, it's not so hard. You, you pick a spot and you watch that spot revolve around. You wait for the spot to come back to the same spot it was in the spot you know, when you first spotted it and you, you'll get out your, your stopwatch and that's the day. How do you do that on a gas giant? How do you do that on a gas giant? Because gas giants have these massive atmospheres with huge complex wind systems that might or might not be rotating just as quickly as the interior core part. So how fast is it rotating? When it comes to Jupiter, we were able to use Jupiter's magnetic field and watch how its magnetic field rotates around. And then you can do some fun computer modeling of the interior and get at a rotation speed. Saturn was much, much trickier because Saturn has an incredibly weird magnetic field that is not regular at all. So it didn't provide a good stopwatch for you. But a mystery may have been solved. A graduate student from the UC Santa Cruz uh, used data from the Cassini mission, which remember the Cassini mission's done. The Cassini mission's long done, but it collected a lot of data. There's still a lot more science to do from that Cassini mission. And instead of looking at the magnetic field of Saturn to figure out what's going on on the inside, this graduate student looked at the rings. So, Saturn itself, like any planet, is, is constantly vibrating with earthquakes, not earthquakes, Saturn quakes. It's constantly roiling and shifting around and vibrating and pulsating. And this changes the gravitational field outside of the planet itself, just by a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, but it happens, right? So if you're standing there outside, floating there outside of Saturn, you'll feel little wiggles and, and bumps and, and shifts as Saturn just rotates underneath you, as Saturn changes on the inside. And since Saturn has these giant rings, 
there are these tiny little differences can show up in the rings where you can see little waves and little patterns, little features that will appear and then disappear and then reappear again. So again, connecting to some really, really fun advanced computer models, this graduate student was able to look at the way the rings rippled very, very slightly under the influence of these changes to Saturn's gravity. And from there, estimate what the interior looks like and how long the rotation really is. Because if the same feature comes along at a certain amount of time, that's probably connected to the length of the day on Saturn. And they came up with a number. They came up with a number uh, 10 hours, 33 minutes, and 38 seconds. Surprisingly nimble for a planet that size. That's the latest and greatest when it comes to space. It's time to have a conversation. Space cadets, wow, live streamers. I, uh, you know how much I love you, right? You know. We got a lot of voicemails today. So maybe I'll do at least one space cadet question, but we got a lot of voicemails today, which is so exciting. I think the new website-y thing is helping. So uh, we'll, we'll go jump right to a voicemail for the first bit. And then we'll just go from there. We'll make it up as we go along. And to start off today's show, we have a voicemail. Greg, play the tape. Hi, my name is Hunter, and I have a question that I have been wondering for a very, very long time. What would happen if two black holes came together? Ooh, Hunter, great question. What would happen if two black holes came together? So we all know a black hole is a like a void in space-time itself. It's a puncture in space-time. It's a point of infinite density surrounded by a shell that we call the event horizon, a boundary. You can't see this boundary, you can't feel this boundary, you can't touch or taste this boundary, but the boundary exists, it's invisible. And if you cross that boundary, then you cannot escape. So that's a black hole. Black holes exist. Sometimes black holes eat other things like stars or planets or Greg, I don't know, or eagles, you know, whatever. They just swallow things. And sometimes black holes merge. And when black holes merge, it is such a, a beautiful sight. We don't have any pictures of it, of black holes actually merging. We don't have any black pictures of black holes, period. But we can do computer simulations. We understand general relativity. We understand the mathematics behind black holes. And we, so we can use that to predict what happens. And it's not like black holes just crash into each other. Crashing into each other is very, very hard in space because there's so much space, it's very, very easy to miss. But instead, what happens is that if two black holes get caught in an orbit around each other, then as they're orbiting, as they're orbiting, they're mixing up space-time underneath them. And that mixing up of space-time sends out gravitational waves like ripples in a pond. And that pulls energy from the system. It takes energy from the system and it causes these black holes to slowly, slowly spiral in towards each other, getting closer and closer and closer. And then this process can take a very long time, like a million years, before they inch and inch and inch closer. And finally, when they're as they get closer, they start spiraling faster. And they spiral faster, they emit more gravitational waves, which pulls more energy from the system, so they spiral in even faster. And it goes out of control, out of control, out of control, out of control. And then as they get closer, their event horizons stretch to meet each other because they're so gravitationally attracted to each other. And as they get close, they'll stretch and stretch and stretch, and they'll meet at a point. And that point will expand, and it's these black holes look for a very brief amount of time, look like they're kissing, like they're kissing. And then as they merge, as they merge, that kiss widens and widens and widens, and then they merge together. The event horizon looks like a dumbbell at first, and then it merges back into a sphere. The singularities at the center within a microsecond are able to merge and become a single singularity at the center. After the merger event, the black hole vibrates you know there's all this extra rotation so it's it's literally vibrating 
in space at right after this merger. And that vibration itself sends its own kinds of ripples out into space time that pull energy from it. And it eventually settles down and it looks like a single black hole. Now this single black hole, that's a result of the merger of the two black holes, isn't you, if you looked at the mass of black hole A and black hole B, like this one's 10 solar masses and this one's 10 solar masses, and you merge them together, you don't get a 20 solar mass black hole because so much energy is pulled away in gravitational waves that there's not enough mass left over. So you might add a 10 solar mass and a 10 solar mass, and you'll end up with, say, a 16 or an 18 solar mass black hole because so much energy was pulled away in the merger event itself. And how we know this picture is right is from the gravitational waves. We can't see this, there's no explosion, there's no bomb, there's no flash of light, there's no supernova. This is all happening whisper quiet in the black vacuum of space, but space time itself ripples, we can see the ripples from the merger event, we can see this ringing down phase after the merger that is the key signature of two black holes merging. This is what we discovered a few years ago with the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory that finally saw this signature, this sign, this chirp, as they called it, because this happens in less than a second, this chirp of two black holes merging, one of the most energetic events in our universe that happens in complete and total silence. Excellent question, Hunter. What a great way uh, to tell a little story about black holes. I'm Paul Sutter and this is Space Radio. This show is brought to you by you. Go to space, uh, no, go somewhere else. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you, yes, you can keep this show on the air. I greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you after the break. I like black holes. Black hole. I love it. Timothy black hole merger, a love story mm. to become one. That's a song, right? Probably not. All right. We got so many good questions. I'm going to take at least, at least another voicemail and then Ooh, Timothy, are there any places in our space where time where strange time top or bond quarks are stable? Love that question. Definitely doing that one. And man, you space cadets, right here, right here. All your good questions. Ooh, a point particle. Okay, I got at least a couple. Space Cadet questions. Where, where are you, Timothy? I like that. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. Got more questions ready to go, but remember, you can join the conversation by calling 888-581-0708 or by leaving a voicemail directly on the website. That's spaceradioshow.com or by following the live streams with all the other amazing Space Cadets. Check out spaceradioshow.com for all those links and buttons and doohickeys. Now, it's time for a voicemail. Greg, play the tape. Hi, my name is Scarlett and I'm 10 years old. I just wanted to ask, what, what would happen if the Earth stopped spinning for one millisecond? Looking forward to the answer. Bye. All right, Scarlett, who is 10 years old, what a fun, fun question. What would happen if the Earth stopped spinning for a very specific amount of time, one millisecond? Like, you know, we're rotating, we're spinning, and then stop and then start, like in that millisecond. So, on if you're watching from outside, if you're orbiting the Earth or something, and we have that kind of glitch, not much is going to change, right? Because it just happens in a millisecond. But here on Earth, if we stopped, and started in a millisecond or rotation, bad news everywhere. I am talking complete and total destruction. I'm talking about buildings falling over. I'm talking about tsunamis. I'm talking about eagles falling from the sky in the middle of flight. Like it's just total mayhem. And why? 
because the earth is spinning so fast. I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's tens of thousands of miles per hour. And we don't notice it because we're going tens of thousands of miles per hour along with the earth. We're standing on the earth. It's rotating. We're rotating too. So it looks totally normal to us. But if you've been in a car and you're cruising along at you know 80 miles an hour and you don't really feel like you're going 80 miles an hour, you're just cruising along and then bam, you hit the brakes, the car stops. What happens to you? The car stops. You keep going. You keep going. That's the whole point of seat belts and airbags is to cushion you as you slow down from 80 miles an hour to zero miles per hour. Now imagine if you didn't have seat belts and you didn't have airbags, you're just going to keep going 80 miles through an hour through the windshield and over the hood and onto the, onto the pavement. Sorry to get gruesome there in my analogy. Now ramp that up to tens of thousands of miles per hour, tens of thousands of miles per hour where the earth just stops, but you keep going. So look at the walls around you. Look at the walls around you. The floor underneath you is going tens of thousands of miles per hour. The walls are each going tens of thousands of miles per hour. You're going tens of thousands of miles per hour. And then you stop bad news. And then because you very precisely specified one millisecond, and then you start again, bad news again. What, what would be the level of discretion? I have no idea. Probably all man-made structures would be obliterated. We would certainly suffer some <laughs> not too pleasant effects. The oceans would shift. I mean, there'd be probably be massive tides, massive tsunamis. It'd just be, it'd be horrible. Like that is a lot of energy getting dumped out of the earth and put back into the earth in a very, very quick amount of time. And that kind of energy is not so much fun. What a wonderful question, Scarlett. Thank you so much for calling. Now back to the space cadets who have been patiently waiting all episode for an answer to one of their questions. I have a question here from Timothy. Is there anywhere in space or time where strange charm top and bottom quarks are or were stable? So by the way, you may not know this, there are these kinds of particles called quarks. Again, I'm never in charge of naming things. So don't blame me for all the weird lame names in physics and astronomy. If you look at a particle like a proton, you know, which is inside an atomic nucleus, the proton is not fundamental. It's made of smaller things. We call those smaller things quarks. There are six known quarks in nature, and we think six total. They're called up, down, top, bottom, strange, and charm, again, for various lame reasons. The quarks inside of a proton are the up and down quarks. There are two ups and a down make up a proton, and then two downs and an up to make a neutron, if you're ever curious. These are by far the most common kinds of quarks in the universe. Why? Because they're the lightest quarks in the universe. There are six quarks, and they have all different masses. And when it comes to fundamental particles, the, the smaller you are, the less massive you are, the more stable you are. If you're heavy, if you're big, even if you're a fundamental particle, if you're big, you won't have a long lifetime because there's more stable stuff for you to transform into. And so the other quarks like top and bottom, strange and charm are usually only produced in reactions, uh, might pair up, might form exotic particles that have lifetimes of, I don't know, a microsecond. They don't exist in stable form in nature with one possible exception. One possible exception. We know that white dwarfs are dead stars. These are dead stars supported by the pressure provided by the electrons inside of them. And we know that there are neutron stars. Neutron stars are also dead stars supported by the pressure of the neutrons inside of them. Now we think, we're pretty sure, that if you tried to take a neutron star and squish it down even more, you would turn it into a black hole. But there might be an intermediate step. There might be a kind of star that is smaller than a neutron star or denser than a neutron star, but not a black hole that is supported by the pressure provided by quarks themselves. 
And it turns out when you when you think of this, when you start exploring it mathematically, like could this kind of object exist, a quark star exist, that it can't be made of up quarks or down quarks or top quarks or bottom quarks or charm quarks, just for various reasons, those kinds of configurations are very unstable. But strange quarks, strange quarks might be able to glue themselves together to make giant objects. Like we're talking the size of a city, like a few miles across, a ball of strange quarks. We call these things strange stars, and they are indeed very strange stars. Now, do strange stars exist in the universe? We honestly don't know. We don't know theoretically because this is kind of exotic physics, so we're not exactly sure. We can't really plant our flag on that idea and say, yes, the theory 100% absolutely predicts something stable like this. We're not exactly sure. And observationally, a strange star doesn't look all that different than a neutron star. It's not that much smaller. It's not that much brighter. The neutron stars themselves might have strange cores inside of them, and then they're surrounded by neutron material. We don't know if strange stars exist, but that is the one, if they did, that would be the one place in the universe where something other than the normal garden variety up and down quarks would exist over long time scales. Excellent question, Timothy. We're almost out of time. Man, this show goes so fast. But before we go, it's time for the blue shift. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the blue shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And this came up, this topic, I'm going to talk about the difference between a law and a theory. This topic came up earlier this week. So I do uh, various kinds of live streams, if you don't know. I'm on Weekly Space Hangout every Wednesday at 8. And I'm also over on Twitch on Skylias. That's twitch.tv slash S-K-Y-L-I-A-S, Skylias. She live streams like all the time, like eight hours a day. And I show up every Tuesday or so uh, for an hour and just do random Q&A and have some fun. And one of her listeners asked this very cool question about the difference between a law and a theory. And I'm sure you've heard both terms. So a law is something that we see in observations, that a law is something that we see in the data, that we see in nature, something very repeatable and regular, something that every single experiment always gives the exact same result. This is something we call a law. It's like so regular, so dependable. You're just like, we're just going to call it a law. Like we're not, we're not really going to test this anymore because we already tested it 500,000 times and we're getting a little tired. We'd like to investigate something else. So we'll just call it a law and we'll assume it's true. It's something born out of observations. A theory, a theory is something born out of our minds. A theory is something born out of our attempt to explain how nature works. And so laws and theories meet each other. Laws are just bare statements about the universe. Like here's an observation, it happens all the time, boom, law. No explanation, no cause, no fundamental reason, just here's something we always see in nature. The theory is the attempt to explain it. The theory is the attempt to wrap a mathematical structure around it that gives it a cause, that gives it a reason, that is able to explain it in more fundamental terms and more beautiful and elegant terms that are able to make predictions. Yes, laws can be wrong because we might do the experiment tomorrow, number 500,001, and it might turn out something different. Theories themselves are always going to be wrong. They're always approximations. They're always estimates. They're always approaches to descriptions of nature without actually becoming a totally complete description of nature. So both are subject to change at all times. But this is the difference. Theory is our attempt to explain laws. Laws are things we observe in nature. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by the Ohio State University Department of Astronomy. Learn more at astronomy.osu.edu. This show is also brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash pmsutter 
to learn how you can keep the show going. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the Space Cadets, Dan Michalka for being awesome, and all the fine crew at WCBE Radio for making this show possible. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Call 888-581-0708 or leave a voicemail on our website. And you can join me on the air. You can also catch the live streams on YouTube and Twitch. Go to spaceradioshow.com for all those links. And of course, thanks again, Earthlings, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission. We did it. We did it. Do I need to do a promo? Okay. You guys get to watch me do it. Just one. Oh, just one minute. Greg needs a minute before I can record a promo. Send cheese. Hashtag send cheese. Packing up my studio. Packing up my studio. Packing up my studio. Greg, come on, Greg. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Huh? I can't hear you. Tick tock, the clock. The dance thing? The dance thing. We're working on it. We're working on it. We got one section left. Uh, I'll be visiting New York uh, in February to to finish up uh, TikTok. Okay, now now well, I gotta get my clock out. Now I got don't give me the finger. No, I, that finger. You can give me that finger. That's the finger you can give me. All right. I'm Paul Sutter, host of Space Radio here on WCBE 90.5 FM. And coming up in Saturday's episode, we're going to talk about what would happen if the Earth were to stop spinning. Would it be good? Would it be bad? Would it be neutral? My vote's on bad, but you're going to have to catch the rest of the show to see why. That's Space Radio, Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern here on WCBE 90.5 FM. And now you're coming in. So good at promos. Are we done? You just know I'm the one? All right. Bye, Space Cadets. See you next week.